So this is actually my first DFIR summit, and so far it's been really great, and it's also my first trip to Texas, and I'm really loving it, loving the food, especially the barbecue. So if you haven't been able to figure out, I am actually from Australia. I apologize for the accent. I promise I'll try not to sound like Steve Irwin. So I've been doing law enforcement for about 12 years now, and digital forensics for six, uh, mostly dealing with things like your garden variety, murders, rapes, terrorism offenses, that sort of thing. I'm also a bit of a hardware tinkerer. Um, I've used to build battle bots and uh, other things like arcade emulators, that sort of thing. But my main passion at the moment is hard drives, and specifically where the fields of data recovery and forensics intersect. Just a quick shout out to uh, Cheeky Forensic Monkey for the picture. Um, the title of my presentation is actually a Star Wars quote, so thank you for that. If you haven't checked out his blog, it's pretty good. So a bit of a background story to this presentation. In 2013, the uh, source code for a Linux-based tool called Hard Drive Hacker was actually released onto the internet. And for those that don't know, this, this tool is actually designed to take a Western digital hard drive and alter the firmware so that it reports as a Fujitsu drive and actually alter the size as well. People would actually do this to insert these hard drives into Xbox 360s. So instead of buying the upgraded 60 gigabyte version, or if their hard drive had died, they'd just use this feature in a Western digital drive. So myself and a few other people started to look at what this tool actually did. And it became apparent that through some fairly simple uh, firmware manipulation, this tool was able to actually trick something as secure as an Xbox 360 into thinking that this drive was a completely other drive and a completely different size. So armed with my forensic knowledge, I realized that, that obviously has serious implications for hiding data. The other thing that really piqued my interest was around the same time, the NSA's toolkit uh, catalog was actually released onto the internet, and it was clear that I wasn't the only one thinking that hiding data through firmware manipulation was a pretty cool idea. So what do I mean by metamorphic? Well, we're going to change the way a hard drive appears. We're going to do that in two ways. We're actually going to change the external appearance of a hard drive, as well as the internal appearance through that firmware manipulation. We're also going to restrict the area that is accessible to the hard drive. And within that restricted area, we're actually going to hide some badness, which could be something like an encrypted container, a key file, or just the evidence that you're trying to look for. It's important to understand that this isn't a host protected area or, or device configuration overlay. They used to be a bit of a problem for forensics, but there are a number of tools and techniques that have since come out uh, where that is essentially no longer a problem. We're actually going to manipulate the firmware. So what exactly is hard drive firmware? Well, it's important to understand that a hard drive is an embedded system. It's essentially functioning in the same way as a PC functions. The firmware contains boot code that it needs to initialize. It also contains unique parameters, such as like the fly height of the heads or any kind of deviations in the tracks um, on the platters themselves. It also contains unique identification information that that's what gets reported to our forensic tools or to our operating systems and it's found in precisely two and a half locations. So this view should look familiar to most people. It's the underside of a hard drive. We're just going to have a look at uh, some of the locations that the firmware can be found in. And we're going to have a look at the other side of the PCB, because that's where some of these chips are. So we'll just have a closer look at that, which is uh, it's a bit blurry now. So I'll just hit this Enhance button right next to the Find Evidence button. There we go, a little bit clearer now. All right, so the first chip that we're gonna look at is the processor. Much like a computer, it handles all the, the computational functions. The first, the first area that the processor will look for firmware is actually on the ROM chip, and that's that chip there. It's also called the BIOS chip because it has such a similar function to BIOS. It contains some of the identifi identification information, but also the boot code. The half a location is actually the RAM chip, it, it actually stores, obviously, whilst the hard drive is actually functioning, some of the uh, firmware that it needs, such as the zone table. And out of interest, that's the motor controller. If you're wondering what that other chip was, no firmware on there. It controls the motor. Now, this is obviously the inside of a hard drive, and the hard drive has actually conveniently marked the system area for us. It's done that by a system of aggressive polishing of the hard drive platter um, using the head, which is not ideal. Uh, and the system area is the last location of firmware that gets read. The location of the system area is actually found on the ROM chip, so the, 
the hard drive needs to read that first to know where the system area is. So this is where the bulk of the firmware is, though, in the system area. That's actually one of the areas that we'll be focusing on. So this is actually one of my colleagues' hard drives. And if you look up in the top left-hand corner, there's a bit of a gap up there. Uh, so all that aggressive polishing has actually scratched away some of the magnetic media, and that's now found inside that air filter, uh, which should sit up in that top left-hand corner. So I've successfully recovered his data, and when I gave him back his data in this form, he, um, he didn't seem too impressed. <laughs> so we're going to make a number of changes to our hard drive. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, the manufacturers do that by using what's called vendor-specific commands. These commands uh, can be used to change uh, the firmware or read the firmware in the system area, the ROM, the RAM, all of those locations. How they go about doing it and, and what the actual commands are is totally up to them. No one tells them what to do in that regard, uh, whereas the normal functioning is governed by the ATA standards. So they use these commands for uh, quality assurance at manufacturing, for initial uh, production, for diagnostics repair later on, and they're usually done through either the SATA interface or through serial uh, connection, which you'll sometimes see little pins next to um, the SATA data ports on a PCB, that's usually an indication that's a serial interface. So these vendor-specific commands can do quite a lot of interesting things, and we certainly wouldn't want them to be in the wrong, the wrong hands. So from a security perspective, we'd ideally like them to be just known to the manufacturer. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, a number of data recovery tools have emerged that have reverse-engineered these vendor-specific commands, and the first, um, first lot of them were around $5,000, $10,000. So from a security perspective, I guess you could argue that, well, that's a fairly significant price point. At least only um, professionals are going to be using those kind of tools, which is a fair argument. Um, unfortunately, those tools themselves have been reverse engineered, and now there's a number of $100 to $500 software and hardware solutions. So um, I guess you could say, well, at least there's some price point barrier, um, as you'd expect. <laughs> Those tools themselves have been reverse engineered, and either through them or through disgruntled employees, the actual vendor-specific commands for two out of the three main manufacturers that are left um, in the hard drive business are easily obtained on the internet. The third is still out there, it's just a little harder to find. And those two out of three manufacturers represent about 80% of the hard drive sales. So security, not so good. So this presentation is not intended to name and shame the manufacturer. As I'm going forward, you'll actually might be able to work out which manufacturer I'm specifically talking about. I obviously don't intend to shame them in particular. All of the hard drive manufacturers' vendor commands are out there. Their security is all basically on par. I also don't want to provide a walkthrough for people because obviously we don't want this to become a common practice. And I obviously don't want to disclose any intellectual property. What I do want to do is to start a bit of a conversation about this area of concern, um, show how easily it could be done, how well the data is hidden, and discuss any implications and risks. So instead of using one of the real manufacturers, uh, Toshiba, Seagate, or Western Digital, uh, we're going to use an analogous manufacturer instead. I'm from Australia, which in Latin means southern, so it's going to be called the Southern Analog. Uh, we're going to perform two alterations, and one's being the exterior and the other being the interior, using firmware. So here are our two drives. We've got a two terabyte and a one terabyte. What we're going to do is we're going to take the lid off the one terabyte and put it on the two. To do that, we need to take the number of screws off. You can see a couple of them there. A few others are underneath those black stickers. And one's actually underneath the label, right about the point where it says, warranty void if label removed, which I thought was kind of ironic, considering what I was about to do to this drive. So these two drives are actually fairly similar. They have uh, quite similar model numbers. They vary in one digit, which just represents the difference in their size. And they're manufactured within three months of each other. Now, it's important to understand that I have specifically chosen these drives for a reason, but this particular method could actually work with, say, a six or an eight terabyte drive and a one terabyte drive. There's nothing to stop. Um, the, the drives can be that drastically different. So here we've taken off our one terabyte uh, lid, and we've also got the lid already moved from our two terabyte. Now, I say it's the two terabyte drive that you can see there, but I could have just as easily showed you a picture of the one terabyte, and that's because these drives share the exact same internals. It's actually a common practice from hard drive manufacturers for quite a number of years. They'll actually produce 
a whole run of the same physical drive and then just manipulate the firmware to change the capacity. The reason they do that is for costs uh, of production and there's an economy of scale reason why it's better for them to price point a low, a middle and sort of a high end drive. And in this particular case, this one terabyte drive and this two terabyte drive are exactly the same. So we're gonna put our label on and we're gonna smooth down and put down our stickers, which was just oh so fun. And we get, ta-da, a one terabyte drive. So exciting. Um, a little underwhelming, I know, but that's because it just looks like a one terabyte drive, I'm afraid. So we're gonna connect that up to our write blocker just to make sure it's still reporting as a two terabyte drive, just as we'd expect, because we haven't done anything to it yet. So that's all good. So now we're gonna move on to changing that internal um, appearance using that firmware manipulation. So our fictional manufacturer needs to work out how it's going to send the vendor specific commands to our drive. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna piggyback on the ATA standard smart command transport protocol, which in this case, we're gonna use the smart write log and smart read log commands. Normally these commands are used to send smart data, which I assume everyone knows what that is, um, or read smart data back from the hard drive. So instead of sending those smart logs, we're gonna send our vendor specific command and also either read or write our firmware with it as well. So because we're using commands that already exist, we need to tell our drive to look for something a little different. And we're gonna do that by giving it a, uh, sending it a super on or a firmware mode or a boot code mode uh, command. And that's uh, it down below. I've obviously changed a couple of things so it doesn't actually reveal what it is including the actual hard drive manufacturer's initials, which they decided to put into the code. And next we're gonna send the smart write log command. Uh, so this is actually gonna have the vendor specific command attached to it. That's uh, also been slightly changed, uh, but everything else apart, apart from that is just a standard smart write log um, command as specified by the ATA standards. And along with that is gonna be our VSC file, which the VSC is generally around three or 16 bytes, uh, padded with zeros to 512 bytes. Next, we send the smart read log command, and this is what's gonna either write our new firmware or read back our firmware that we've requested. Once again, the standard command, but with some changes um, so that it doesn't reveal what it is. To do this, you could use a tool such as MHDD, uh, which is able to be booted off USB. Um, it's actually, the program that the guy who would then go on to found the Atola company, uh, which creates uh, data recovery tools, uh, wrote some time before then. It's got a simple scripting language, and you can use something like Notepad or a hex editor to actually generate the files necessary for it. So this is the script. We can see the super on command is up the top. Uh, just below that is the smart write log command, and it's including our vsc.bin, which is our vendor specific command, which we'll have a look at in a second. Our smart read log uh, command is next, and it's actually gonna output the config.bin, which is our requested firmware module, which has gotta have all our configuration data. So let's have a look at quickly at the VSC. I've blanked out the command. Uh, there's an option for read or write, and which firmware module, so it's fairly simple to, to work out. So this is MHDD, it's a simple looking DOS-like utility, but it's pretty powerful. And this is the returned data, which has come out all right. Uh, so in this firmware module is uh, a number of uh, identification information like the serial number, the model number, uh, the ATA master password, the ATA user password, if those things have been set. Uh, if you have a look up the top right, it's got a four byte 32 bit checksum that's actually the only kind of security that a hard drive will have of its firmware. And even then, it's not really security, it's more of a data integrity. Um, it's there to see if any data has been corrupted rather than if it's been changed. Uh, and below that, down the bottom, you'll see a four byte uh, value in Little Endian. And to the left and up, and just up of that, you'll actually see a, rep, uh, a repetition of that, of that value. Those are the values that represent the LBA um, capacity size, the HPA size, the DCO size, the what's called the D stroke size, and the max LBA. And it's those values that we want to change to limit our capacity. 
So once you realize where the data is stored, how to change it, it becomes a rather trivial matter as to what you want to change it to. In this case, what we'd want to change it to is our one terabyte drive's details, because we've got our two terabyte drive, we want to make it seem like a one terabyte drive. We've already changed the lid. So we change it to the one terabyte drive's model number, serial number, and its capacity. Unfortunately, for demonstration purposes, that's a little pedestrian. So this is a hard drive that I've, I've changed, and I hope it would raise some concerns if it came along for your examination. So it's been manufactured by you. It's a one terabyte hard drive, wink, wink. And it's going to detonate in five seconds. <laughs> so that's how we do it manually. But what I'm going to show is how quickly, well, reasonably quickly, it is to hide the data and how well it's hidden from a typical examination. Uh, so we're going to use one of those $100 software tools, and we're going to use one of the free demo versions that it comes with. So we're going to take our two terabyte drive, and we're going to have a look at it in our hex editor. We're going to go to the one terabyte marker and go one sector just beyond that. We're going to copy some badness. In this case, it's a picture of a cat in ASCII. We're going to save that data to the disk at that point. We're then going to close the drive. And what we need to do then is use our tool to change the maximum LBA size to one terabyte. So this tool also has the function of restarting the firmware and stopping the motor, which we need to do because we need these changes to take effect. They can't work necessarily on a live hard drive, so to speak. So we need to stop the motor and then we need to unplug it because we need Windows to unmount the disk and then redetect it. During that time, I'm doing stuff off camera, so I've put up a cute kitty that you can have a look at while I'm doing that. And uh, so we need to clear the mounted disk. Yes, I'm using Windows XP. No, it's not connected to the internet. And yes, it takes forever. So our one ter sorry, our two terabyte disk is no longer detected by Windows. So what we need to do now is replug the drive back in, and it needs to initialize from Windows again now that our changes would have taken effect on the hard drive. So we're going to stare at the kitty for a little bit longer. And now our one terabyte drive has been detected. We're going to add it back into our hex editor, and we're going to go to that end of the, the drive and see that our badness is no longer there. Now imagine this drive has now gone to forensic examination, and the, um, the forensic examiner has not been able to find any badness, um, so it's been returned to our target. The target wants to get to his badness again. He changes the LBA back to the original two terabyte, restarts the firmware, stops the spindle motor. So we need to unplug the drive again, clear it from, from Windows, because it was showing up as our one terabyte. And obviously, do the same procedure again. Plug the drive back in, wait for it to initialize from Windows. Stare at the kitty for one final time. And our two terabyte drive has now come back online. We're going to add it to our hex editor, go to the one terabyte point at which we had hidden our badness, and there's our badness again. All right, so what are the implications, essentially, of this manipulation and hiding of data? Well, unfortunately, it creates a drive that is indistinguishable uh, from a normal drive. Our operating systems, forensics tools, even the data recovery tools that are out there won't be able to tell any difference uh, 
with what the drive is telling, they, what, telling it what it is. So, which raises the question, how many of these drives have we missed? The answer is, well, we don't really know. We've never really looked for them. Um, I'd hazard a guess it's probably not many. It's a bit of a unique uh, tool and a unique set of knowledge that's required to do this manipulation. But in truth, we don't actually know. It also has implications in terms of uh, exfiltration of data. Uh, in a company, um, an employee might want to take all the company's secrets with them to their, their new employer. They could literally hand a hard drive full of their personal photos to the security team. They'd have a look through it, and they wouldn't find the secrets because it's well hidden. It also has ramifications in terms of uh, the infiltration of data, um, in terms of supply chain. You could actually get this and uh, insert it well before it gets to your target destination, but that's probably a topic for another presentation. So what can we do to actually try and see if this has been employed? Well, we could start looking for clues, and some of those clues would be the software or hardware uh, that can actually perform these functions, and here's a list of them. I'd also add to that some of the technical documents that um, you could use to help learn about this process, such as the ATA standards, um, or internet history that, um, to websites such as HDD Guru or HDD Oracle. Both of those websites were pretty good in my learning of this area. So from a forensics perspective, what, what can we look for? Well, if they're using a tool such as MHDD or some of the other tools, there's gonna be firmware that's, that's copied locally. Um, there could be artifacts in terms of scripts or those VSC files. Uh, you could also compare the internals of the drive. Like I said, this can be done with a, a large drive and a very small drive. So is there a discrepancy between the weight that you'd expect of a, of a one terabyte or a 500 gig drive? Does it feel as heavy as a, as a six terabyte drive actually does? And, and lastly, anything that is suspicious, it needs to undergo further, deeper interrogation. This is a bit of a workflow I'd suggest could be followed uh, for that deeper interrogation. Once obviously you've got a forensic image or, or whatever you're used to doing, uh, copy all firmware of, of the drive that you can get your hands on. You then want to inspect that firmware, looking for any, in, any discrepancies. Ideally, you'd want something like a known good firmware sample to compare that against, but then you'd also want to inspect that firmware and see what that is reporting as to what the internals are. So say, in the case of a one terabyte drive, if it's got two platters, four heads, and it looks like two of those heads are disabled, maybe that's a good candidate for being manipulated. And lastly, I haven't come across anything that would actually damage the drive by manipulating the size to larger than what it was intended for. What seems to happen is this, the tool that you're using would just report an error saying that it hasn't worked. So two of the problems that may come in trying to investigate this kind of thing, one I've already covered, is that physical identical drives uh, make it very hard to distinguish if this manipulation has occurred because manufacturers literally are manipulating the drive before sale. Um, and the other is also from the manufacturer, and it's called refurbished drives. And that's where a customer may send a drive back because they're having issues with it. Let's say it's a four terabyte drive. Um, and the manufacturer may say, well, here's a fresh four terabyte drive. But they've still got this four terabyte drive that's not working. Perhaps they could, you know, Frankenstein it into a two terabyte drive that'll work. And some other sucker that's sent back their two terabyte drive now gets this refurbished two terabyte drive. The trouble is, when they perform that repair work, it's very unique, it's, it's unusual, it's, it's not repeatable, so distinguishing those kind of drives from something a target's done would also be a bit of a problem. So these are some solutions that I think should at least be explored uh, to try and tackle this problem. And the first I mentioned was known good firmware samples. There actually are repositories of firmware uh, that exist on data recovery forums and data recovery websites. They're not too bad. Uh, next. The manufacturers maybe should start looking at ways of ensuring the integrity uh, and you know, verifying that integrity of, their, of the firmware. So certain firmware modules should never change, others they do. So the ones that are at least static, things like uh, hashing or something along those lines to ensure that those firmware modules haven't changed or at least throw up a flag to say they have. And lastly, Something like, a, I'm not sure, but a TPM module uh, model might actually work in this scenario. And that's something they've sort of started to move towards. Uh, they've got these drives called FIPS, F FPIS, standard uh, models. Um, 
they, they start to sort of move in that, in that direction. And finally, the future research in this particular space. Uh, so there's actually a command that you can actually write to the physical cylinder head sector of a hard drive, and a proof of concept tool and white paper were produced by two Israelis, and what you could do is actually take this spare one terabyte or however big size um, spare that you've, you've created, and if you manage to write that, those locations into the system area, you could use this command to actually read and write directly to that location without the need to reinitialize the drive or change any of that identification information because Windows wouldn't need to change uh, because it's just gonna stay the same identification at that point. And lastly, solid state drives are an emerging area. They actually contain over-provisioned over uh, sectors. So what kind of possibility exists in that space is also another area I'd like to explore. Thank you very much. Are there any questions?